So today now, the way I would like to go about this is, instead of just going through various sections of the Civil Procedure Code or the Evidence Act or any other statute for that reason, I thought that it would be nice to go through a case, a whole trial action, right from the time the matter is brought before me to the time when the judgment is delivered by the court. This is, of course, a long process, but it will really take us through everything that I do, whether it is right from the first meeting with the client, advising him about what he can do and what his rights are, then filing whatever requires to be filed, and actually arguing the matter and getting the final judgment. Um, so lawyers uh, are of different kinds. And from the point of view of my being a counsel and arguing in court for my clients, you can divide them up basically into litigators and non-litigators. And the descriptions given there are my descriptions. Litigators are basically fighters. They fight out the cases, whether they are in a court or before an arbitrator or whatever, but that's when the dispute has really started and the fight has started. Non-litigators are very often facilitators. They enter into agreements, they draft other documents, etc., and they, they have a host of other uh, activities which they perform and services which they give. And that's why I call them facilitators. Though I must say that I know a number of litigators who like to settle matters and a number of non-litigators who foment litigation. But that's on the lighter side. So then we come to the actual jobs that a non-litigator can do. And if you can see from the slide, you can get it. There is a lot of client consultation and advice, which is the clients will contact them, ask them for advice in their business, will ask them for advice on how to run their businesses. There may be regulatory compliances. There may be contracts which they want to enter into, etc. So that's one important part of their work. Then they will obviously, in point two, you will say they'll be drafting agreements. They, if it's important correspondence, they will be drafting that for the client, uh, sending note, sending of notices, etc. That's the kind of work they will do. Then, of course, you have various other documents like powers of attorneys, wills, indemnities, and many, many more. These are just a few examples which are sending, which I have uh, put down. Then in four, you can see that they have, there is a lot of regulatory work, especially these days where the statutes are just proliferating. The compliances that you require to have, whether you're a company or any other entity, are increasing. So you have SEBI compliances, you have compliances which you have to make under the Companies Act. You will have to make compliances under the RBI Act, probably, depending on your business, etc. So that is the kind of work which a non-litigating lawyer, like a solicitor or a law firm, would also help you with. Maybe go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So even amongst litigators, you have uh, different kinds of jobs and different kinds of litigators. So if you see, there is a distinction amongst the nature of the job first on, on the basis of what is the work that you carry out. So if you're an advocate on record, you are the person who represent the client officially in all court proceedings or in arbitrations and in all disputes. You are the person in whose favor the client signs what we know as the Vakalat Nama. All correspondence, notices, etc., will be addressed to you as the advocate on record. And you are the one who will represent the client officially everywhere. On the other hand, if you are a counsel, uh, you will be doing, you will be representing your client in court, as well as doing a lot of the legal uh, litigation drafting work for him. But you will not be the advocate on record, and notices, etc., will not be coming to you. Um, then, of course, litigators can be divided depending on their area of practice, and. This obviously happens because there are just too many laws and you cannot have one advocate practicing every subject under the sun. It doesn't work like that in these days as 
life gets more complicated. So you have you will have your civil lawyers, you will have criminal lawyers, you will have lawyers who practice under uh, special acts, like lawyers who practice only labor laws. And frankly, even that today is not really a specialization because your labor laws include a plethora of laws. You can have your, you will have disputes, you will have uh, uh, employees, gratuity, you will have provident fund, you will have salaries, and you have a large number of labor laws also. So that by itself also is really nowadays not a specialization. You, so you can have specialization within labor law also. And then of course, um, there's your court of practice. So lawyers practice in different courts. Very often that is because it's just not practical to run around to every different court. So you have lawyers who will practice mainly in the high court, lawyers who will practice mainly in the Supreme Court, and sometimes also before specific tribunals like the NCLT, etc. May we move on to the next slide, please? Now, before we come to, before we come to the job of the litigator, I'd like to just say a few words on how a counsel is really different from any other advocate. And this you won't really find in too many books. Counsel practice is a concept which has really, which is more prevalent in Bombay and Calcutta. It really started with the British. And councils are a breed of advocates who specialize. We specialize in appearing in court, representing a client in court, actually arguing the case for him. And when required, also drafting, also drafting pleadings, etc., which are relevant for the litigation itself. So unlike the non-litigating lawyer, who would be drafting agreements, contracts, and other documents which I mentioned, a counsel would normally not be doing that. It's not because we cannot do that or we are not uh, really trained for that because we are advocates. But as a matter of practice, that is not the, the job that we do. And once you don't do that regularly, if I'm not regularly drafting contracts, it doesn't make sense to do that on a one-off basis. So the council will not normally be drafting other documents and agreements and would stick to the job of drafting pleadings for the case and for the litigation itself. Now in this context, may we go to the job of the litigator, the slide before this, please. Yes. So what does my job entail and how does it start? The first thing that would happen probably with a new case is that a solicitor or an advocate on record would come to me probably with his client and say and tell me what the problem is, what the dispute is or what the dispute will become. Because very often we are approached before the matter actually becomes a full-fledged dispute and before any court proceedings are actually filed. That's not necessarily always the case. We are often given a, uh, given a brief to appear in a matter which has already been filed. But sometimes people will come to you right from the inception stage itself and say, I want you to advise me so that we can decide on how to take this forward. We will also decide on whether we are the ones who file the case or we are the ones who wait for the other side to file the case first and decide on how strong or weak our case is and then decide on the course of action which we actually have to take. So you may have a discussion 
at the end of which if you tell the client that listen your case is really not that strong he may decide to not file proceedings he may decide to try to settle the matter he may make greater efforts to settle the matter and that's how the strategy is devised and the way forward is agreed upon or decided once you decide to really go ahead with the case and maybe file some proceedings and go ahead with the dispute then you can have your file your vakalat nama through the advocate on record and the next thing you have to do obviously is you have to draft your pleadings now the pleadings are in the case of a suit the plaint which you will file which is your main complaint which will include what your real case is what you are aggrieved by and the release that you really want then of course we come to point number 4 which is the gathering of the evidence and if you have a look at the clip you will see that i have really placed it before filing the claim or the reply and the reason for that is simply this if you really want to succeed in a matter as a trial lawyer you really have to analyze the evidence prior to filing the claim uh is just not good enough to take instructions draft a plaint file the plaint based on instructions and then say okay now let's see what is the evidence you have to support this case uh it is done in some cases some lawyers do that but that's really not the way you're going to succeed you have to take from your client proper instructions and you have to ask him for what evidence he has right in the beginning because it is only once you consider the nature of the evidence the documents that there are his oral evidence if necessary and only when you once you've analyzed that that you can really know the chances of success in the matter it is only once you have seen the evidence that you know how you will draft your plaint also um if there is if you have a dearth of evidence there is not enough documentary evidence on record you may need to plead various oral evidences so to give it to give a very simple example in a given case between corporates there may be a lot of correspondence there may be many emails that will form your evidence that is what you will put forward to the court and say look this is how we had correspondence this is how we entered into the contract this is how we tried to perform it and this is how the other side has breached it and most of this would be recorded in correspondences and emails but you may have a different kind of a case where you may have a smaller business a sole proprietor you may have a case where parties have known each other for 30 or 40 years and have been doing business for that much time and who therefore don't formalize everything and put everything down in writing such parties may just pick up the phone and may have done number of deals hundreds of deals in the past just over the phone and on the basis of oral conversations and trust and those transactions may all have gone through and then 40 years later one fine day something goes wrong now in that kind of a case you may not have so much uh, documentary evidence you may not have letters you may not have emails you may not have a written contract in that case it's all the more necessary why your pleadings must be very very specific and you may have to actually plead an oral contract you may actually have to plead how the contract was performed and how that can be seen only from the oral talks you have had or how that can be gleaned from the behavior of the parties so a party may point out that listen this was the oral contract i had person to this i sent him these goods and because he got the goods he has actually thereafter acknowledged me uh, acknowledged to me that he has received these goods not necessarily in writing but it can be inferred because of 
some other fact or some other event. And it is when you have cases like this, where they, you don't have direct written evidence that your pleadings have to be done even more carefully. And you have to actually plead these, some of these oral conversations and you have to draw the inferences and you have to actually say so in your plaint. The next step of course is, of course, if you are the recipient of a plaint, you will be drafting a written statement or a reply affidavit, uh, depending on what the proceeding is. But the, the principles will remain the same in the sense that you will in your reply state um, exactly what your case is and the basis on which you have based your claim, which is your evidence, and you will put that forward. Once the pleadings are complete, which is your plaint and your written statement, the court will frame issues. Uh, what are issues? Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what exactly an issue is as per the civil procedure code. Uh, there is a whole order just on issues. So you can have a look at it. But basically, an issue is every relevant question that the court has to decide in order to give a proper final decision in the suit. So the important point in this is really is this. The issue must be a question which the court has to decide to decide the matter correctly. An issue must be relevant. So if you have uh, you, you may be, you may differ from the other side on a number of points. You may have an opposing point of view, but if the matter is not relevant to your claim, the judge really doesn't need to decide it. So the matter must be the question which has to be decided must be relevant to the claim which is made. And secondly, and most importantly, it only becomes an issue if there is a proposal or a proposition which is stated by one side and if that proposition has been disputed by the other side. So to give an example, if the case is about sale of goods and the plaintiff claims that he has not been paid for the goods, an issue could arise if he says, I have delivered these goods to the defendant and the defendant says, I'm sorry, I never received these goods. So you haven't sold me these goods and I don't see why I should pay for them. One of the issues and one of the main issues obviously would be, did the plaintiff actually deliver these goods to the defendant? Um, in, a, in the same example, you could have an issue of a different kind. So the defendant may say, that yes, I received these goods and there's no, there's no issue on delivery of these goods. But when I received these goods, I found that they were completely defective. They were practically valueless to me and they caused me damages of X, Y, Z amount. In that case, the issue will be different. Obviously the issue will not be on whether the goods were delivered or not, because that is an admitted position. The defendant admits that the issue would be, whether the goods were defective or not. And then there would be corresponding issues after that. And therefore, does the defendant have to pay the plaintiff and further issues? Now, once the issues are drafted, and sometimes even before the issues are drafted, there is a process of inspection and discovery which can be undertaken. Now, process of inspection is simply where one party can inspect the documents which the other party is relying upon. And inspecting the documents means physically going and inspecting the originals of all the documents to ensure that the veracity of those documents and the accuracy of those documents. And the process of inspection is therefore 
normally carried out where each party can inspect the documents of each other. Based on what they find, they can always take up further pleas. Uh, the question of inspection obviously becomes a little more important in matters where one party claims a fraud or a forgery or claims that there are some doctored documents on record, etc. In today's world, with commercial transactions being what there are at large, large corporations, very often the uh, question of inspection may not be very important because all the correspondence may be admitted. Neither party may have made any uh, objection or taken any objection on the ground of a forgery or a fraud. And in that context, inspection may be something which is really not that important in a particular case. But in a case of a forgery, etc., you can inspect the document, you can get the document checked by a handwriting expert, you can have the signature checked if you want, and you can take a lot of steps. So inspection is something which is important in some cases, but may not play such an important role in other cases and other matters. The whole process of discovery, on the other hand, is a process where you can actually, if you are a plaintiff and you feel that there are relevant documents, but you don't have them in your possession, you can take various steps to actually force the other side to produce such documents. You can also take steps to approach the court and have such documents obtained from a third party who has those documents. And all these steps are really important before the trial starts because it is only once you have all the evidence on record and with you that you can really prove your case to the hilt. So these steps have to be taken. You have to approach court or you have to call upon the other side to really produce these documents. And it is once you have them that your case becomes that much stronger. You then have to go about gathering evidence and putting it before the court. Now, gathering evidence really means you you collate all the evidence which you have already got. As I had mentioned to you, you, you normally gather your evidence actually before you even file your case if you want to be successful. So you just, when I say gathering evidence, you collate it on. You maybe add whatever evidence you have discovered by the process of discovery. Whatever new evidence, you have new documents you have got from third parties, whatever documents you have managed to obtain from the other side by making an application for production and you put it all together and you present it through your witnesses. So it is your witness who will make his witness statement or affidavit and it is the witness who will produce these documents before the court and will depose about the accuracy about the, of the documents about the veracity of the documents and about the contents of those documents, all of which is your evidence. Obviously, this will be done by both sides. Their witnesses will step into the box and all their evidence will be put forward. And it is after this is done and completed that the matter will be finally argued before the judge. I will go into the details of final argument a little later on, but once the final argument is completed, you will have the judge giving his judgment. And of course, after that, you and if you have succeeded well and good, but whichever party loses will obviously consider filing an appeal. And if it files the appeal, the process restarts and it goes on and on and the only person who benefits from all this are the lawyers. 